Welcome to Theater Spotlight with Julio Martinez, coming to you over LAArtStream.com. I'm Julio Martinez. We're here on location at the Odyssey Theater on, at the corner, where are we? Uh, Olympic and Sepulveda. And we are going to be spotlighting a brand new play. When I was growing up way back in the 1950s, the term mutually assured destruction had to do with the Cold War state of the relationship of the USSR, who could obliterate the world with their atom bombs, and the United States, who could obliterate the world with the atom bombs. The reason they didn't do it was they just didn't want to destroy each other. Well, what if you took that concept into the contemporary, contemporary relationship of three upwardly mobile couples living right here in Southern California. Well, this gentleman is responsible for doing that. Welcome, Peter. Thank Mr. Peter Lefcourt. Responsible, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that, Julio, in the best sense of the word. Uh, and uh, there's someone between us. Uh, yes. Uh, My director. Uh, your director, who you're closely related to. Yes. Now, I just have to ask, that how did you come up with the concept of taking such what we consider an archaic situation back in the 50s that we both knew growing up. I'm sorry to age us out like this. That's okay. This was originally a short story that I had written called Mutually Assured Destruction, essentially just describing the dilemma of a man going into a restaurant in a place he's not supposed to be. He goes to the, he drives 20, 25 miles to take advantage of a discount oil and lube job, and because he's embarrassed to tell his wife, he can't afford to tell his wife he's done this, one of those marital disputes, disputes they have. She accuses him of being stingy. Anyway, he, while his car is being serviced, he walks across the street to get something to eat, and he runs into his best friend's wife and his accountant, having lunch at 3 o'clock in the afternoon with a bottle of red wine. They see him, he sees them, and it creates a situation of embarrassment for all of them. And this was the basis of the short story that I wrote maybe five years ago. Terry, who we were also married, uh, besides working together, one of her roles in life is to make my life more difficult by creating work for me. <laughs> I'm his muse. I think we should put it that way. Things. One of his muses, yeah. I guess you definitely are my muse. And she said to me, there's a play in this short story. And I said, no, there isn't. It's just, you know, that's the situation. It's a funny short story. She said, trust me. And I did. And I sat down and I wrote the script with Terry's aid. Um, and we worked on the script. And she was right. There was a play. And that is what went. So this, what the play is about is are the complications that ensue but caused by this situation. It becomes an escalation of silent threats between these, this group of six people, these three couples. And it's also about the fragility of friendship, uh, how friendship can be challenged at that age. So uh, that's how it came about. It's a, I was about to say six person play, but you have a roving character in this play. Right, played by Michael Caldwell. And he's, um, he kind of, uh, is one of the characters that appears everywhere and, and in different guises. and. Uh, brings, I think, comedy, and he's kind of like the guy that uh, um, sees what's going on and is involved, but, but in, from a peripheral point of view, so it's a great yeah. character. He's a bit of a Greek chorus, I yeah. think, right. and he's a wonderful actor, because we joke that he has to, before the, the play, he has to get into characters. <laughs> he's got seven different characters that he plays. He plays a Mexican waiter, he plays a Starbucks barista, he plays a Vietnamese bikini waxer, uh, he plays female, a female. female. He plays a Korean barbecue chef. He plays Jeeves and Edwardian butler, and he plays a 1940s noir private eye. And he does them all masterfully. The six people involved in this uh, play all have individual problems. They all know things about each other. And it's that dynamic, keeping that dynamic from exploding against each other, which is sort of their main aim in life. They do it relatively successfully, sometimes not so successfully, but that is the thrust of the comedy. It balances out beautifully. Well, the subtitle is adults behaving badly, and they do behave badly. I mean, I think the closest influence of another playwright would be Yasmina Reza, who wrote God of Carnage and Art. 
and she takes civilized people and has them act in a less civilized manner. But you know, the theater is such a dynamic thing. Terry came to this project with some, she, she had a vision of it, which I'll, I'll let her tell you what it is, that really, I think, put it on its feet. From the first, very first time you read the script, you had a vision. Right. Uh, since, you know, I, I believe in when you're directing, uh, having a concept really aids you as the director so that all the questions that are asked, and there are like a million questions that are asked, you can look at the answers through the prism of the concept. Um, so the concept for this particular play is escalation, because that, in fact, is what's happening. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, is, is there going to be a war between these, between these people? And, and things had to move for me, you know, so uh, what moves? You know, wheels move, and rather than, and the set, there's many, many locations, so how do you create a piece of theater where you're not just, you know, you have the living room here, or the kitchen, or the Starbucks, <coughs> or whatever, so the actors move from one spot to the other spot is, to me, visually uninteresting. But if we have something that can be many things so that the audience is always engaged in figuring out, oh, where are we now? And the um, set designer, Celine Diano, actually worked with us on a film that we just finished. Uh, she came up with this idea that they're adults behaving badly. They're like kids. Well, blocks, cubes, different colors, putting them on wheels and having the actors themselves in between the scenes move things with a, a, a kind of fluidity and movement so that everything just keeps on spinning. So that was the first concept I had on the And, that's what and we're, yes, we're that's sitting what we're on them right on. now. I can move it. And you, you can move it. <laughs> things, this becomes a spa, a uh, Korean spa. This is, um, that we even have a love seat where certain things happen. And uh, that isn't it, I'm sorry, Julio, but there is a love seat where uh, who's which that, moves in. And whose moves idea out. was the map? Terry's. Terry. <laughs> right. Because well, that does bring it back into the correlation between the Cold War dynamic of the 50s and 60s. The reason for the map is that when I read Peter's uh, first draft, it's so intelligent, it's so clever, it's so politically interesting, and it's not, you know, an area that I'm really well versed in. So as he's talking about all the different countries, I said to him, I need visual aid, you know, as a director, I need it as an audience, I need it. Can we have a map? Can we have him, you know, deal with a blackboard? And then that moved into, well, not a blackboard, why don't we actually put a map up there? And so that's how that came about. It was basically my, uh, my need to understand visually what Peter was writing about. And to help the audience out, yeah. you actually took the actual characters in the play and put them in various guises. Right. Like a... Um, a czar of uh, well, czar of Russia, right? Uh, North Korean, yes. South, South Korean, Korean, yeah. And uh, the identity becomes really visually compelling. Yeah, good. Thank you. I, I to me, that's a, a, a dynamic that you don't normally see in theater. And the other thing that was important to us was for the audience to be totally engaged at every moment. Because if you're not listening carefully, you can drop out. You know, so these things help. And uh, the main uh, character, Arnie, uh, that he's actually, he goes through the fourth wall and deals with the audience and shows these pictures and makes sure that everybody is connected. So like, you know, the audience is 100% with us all the time, I feel. And that to me was one of the other um, goals that we both had. One of the big questions I have, both of you do a fairly good living in that other industry, film, <laughs> film and television. This is your fifth produced play? Yes. Why do you do it? Oh, I think that's a no-brainer, Julio. I mean, they treat the help a lot better in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Having been a television writer for a number of years, um, and I, I would never denigrate it, it was a, it is a wonderful apprenticeship for writing. It's very lucrative. I met some wonderful people. I did some good work. But essentially, the writer's voice is not what television is about, nor, for that matter, feature films. And I think most writers that I know either to, to really do what they want to do, either write books and or do plays. And I'm lucky enough that at this stage of my career, I have the luxury to do that, because it is a bit of a luxury. Nobody in this entire production is making any money. It's both the good and bad thing about it is that we're all doing this as a labor of love. Uh, we would be delighted to break even, but I don't <laughs> think we're going to do that. 
but everyone has that attitude. It's quite the actors the stage manager, the production designer, line director, all these people are professionals and they choose to do this because we believe that the theater is, as I call it, the, the dessert of life, of art. You know, it's the one thing that, why, you know, it's not all about money and credits, it's, it's about having a good time and allowing your creativity to flourish in the convivial environment. So. Now, Terry, mm -hmm. I first became aware of you on a little series called Beggars and Choosers mm -hmm. on Showtime. You had a recurring role. Though. Right. I played Lillian Wackenhut, who was uh, a sperm-appropriating lesbian. Uh, that's, just like her. Just like me. <laughs> yes, it was typecasting. So, um, yeah. Which I must say, uh, I should clarify, was your series on Showtime. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, when I, I had to sleep with him in order to get the part. <laughs> and then he gives me this part, and then he makes me a lesbian. lesbian right. What can I say? But he then got to choose uh, the woman, the actress, to play my lover. So That was not a lot of fun. I had to <laughs> audition women who would be kissing my wife. Oh, honey. <laughs> well, Beggars and Jesus was, was also a lot of fun. It was a satire of the television business. It was on, on Showtime about 10 years ago. And... Uh, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, I, the television business was a business that I know and worked in, so it was a series that we didn't need any technical advisors for. And I guess the joke was when Terry, when I first got this series, Terry's actor friend said, well, I'm sure you're going to have a lead in this series. And I said to Terry, I said, look, sweetheart, uh, I think you're a marvelous actor. I think you're absolutely great, but I, I don't think it's a good idea for us to do this because I'm going to have be under a lot of stress, and I'm not sure I can handle coming home and complaining about my lead actress, um, I think it's really much better, you know, if you're not the lead. And there was an age-appropriate role for her. And she would tell her actor friends, and they would say things like, well, you know, you can always get another husband, but a lead in the series. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't a whole lot of those. That's true. Terry, a lot I, of husbands, yeah. what got you into directing theater? Because you've had experience in film. Right. You had a, an award-winning short film. Yes. And you've just completed directing a full feature film. Right. Theater um, is, you know, you just love, well, you love theater, right? So it, it, there's so much to play with. It's open. You can use your imagination in a way that, I mean, you can in film, but in, uh, you, you have a stage, you have actors, you have hopefully great material. So how do you create this whole thing so that the audience is really 100% with you? So for me, it's really, um, it's where imagination kind of takes flight. The previous collaboration that I'm aware of was La Ronda de Lunch, mm -hmm. which was at the Skylight Theater mm -hmm. in Hollywood. Was that your first collaboration, writing, directing? For theater, it was, yes. Yes. You know, we had done two short films, one of which I wrote and the other, Terry wrote, um, adapted one of my short stories, uh, Re Recycling Plug. That was the one that we took to Cannes in 2004 Four. Uh, with the American Film Institute. We had to choose a short and that was it. But w Terry's talent as a director, a lot of it comes from the fact that she is an actress, understands actors, understands how to communicate with them, which is not that easy. Uh, actors are, as we all know, a strange species of, of human being. Uh, we love them, but they're not always easy to communicate with. And she understands how to get performances, how to communicate, how to make them better than they think they could be. She also has a great visual sense. She has a background in photography, so she able, she's able to see the entire frame. And in, in, in the theater, it's the entire stage. Uh, we have an interesting dynamic when we're working together. Yes, let's, uh, let's talk about that, shall we? <laughs> Well, it's both the good and bad things because we come home every night and we say, oh my God, we've got to talk about something besides this play or this movie we're doing. It stays with you. It's both the good and bad thing that we're always accessible to one another. Um, but I think the way we've worked it out is when we're making a film, she is the director of the film, I'm the writer, uh, she gets one and a half votes and I only get one vote because yeah. film is a director's medium and it's clearly a director's medium. When we do theater, I get the extra half vote ah. because the theater is a playwright's medium. But we have all our ways of working things out. We don't always agree, but I, I think that is actually a positive. I think you need to have what I call positive pushback. When a director also, when a writer also directs, I think it's perilous because he or she doesn't have another check or balance on the work. 
And you, you need to have it. You need someone to say, you know, that may be brilliant on the page, but it's not plain. The scene is too long, it's too short, it's not effective, there's too much subtext, there's too little subtext. And a lot of times, playwrights and writers don't hear that. They fall in love with their voice and their, and their language. Um, Do you know these characters? Are any of these people <laughs> you love dearly? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, the, the other thing about this play is about people in, who are up in their early 60s. And no, 50s, 60s. 50s and 60s, yeah. OK. And so what we've done is we've created, a, you know, a, essentially a sex farce for people uh, this age. And there's not a lot of that. You know, people assume on, on some level that anybody over 50 doesn't have sex anymore. And we all know that's not true. Um, do I know, though? I think most writers will answer that their characters are parts of themselves. Little bits of this, a little bit of that. Uh, the main character, Arnie Kay, played by Kip Gilman, who narrates the play, is a graphic designer. And he, you know, gets caught in this whirlwind situation all because he wanted to save 20 bucks. <laughs> it's a bit of a shaggy dog story in that sense. Uh, but of course, his voice is probably a lot of my voice. He talks to the audience and he tries to explain to them just what a mess this whole thing has become just because he drove to, to Canoga Park. Um, and, uh, but I think, you know, are any of the characters me? Yes and no. There's always part of my voice in the characters, I think. But I try not to make them all like me. There's Murray, the accountant, who is certainly not me, and there's Herb, the, the broker. The women are very, very different. You know, Eve, who is the one who gets caught with Murray in the Mexican restaurant, I describe her as a cross between an Encino uh, housewife and an aging Vegas cocktail waitress, Br brilliantly played by Bryn Thayer. Carol by uh, Dina Hecht, and Myrna, who's married by, by Gwendolyn Dwyer. So uh, they all she have She really is committed to her part. <laughs> Which one? Gwendolyn? Yeah. yeah she's great. Myrna, absolutely. Because that's the part in a way that changes the most. The right. character that really, she appears one way and absolutely at the end she's totally different and you realize that she actually has insights that nobody thought she would have, right? I won't give away some of her actions on stage. Mm -hmm. Because it is compelling to the audience. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Good. Especially male audiences, yes. I think. Okay, that's good. The other two actors are uh, Stuart Pankin, who plays Herb. He's a wonderful, wonderful actor who has the ability to do comedy and in that comedy have real pathos, you know, so we feel for him. He does anger pretty well. And yeah. anger, beauty, yeah, absolutely. It's funny Passion. anger, which is a hard thing to pull off, but yeah. he does it. Yeah, and then um, Bobby Costanzo, who is great. The Flandering account. That's right, right. Um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful cast. I mean, very, uh, they're perfect, yeah. you know, and working with them and... Yeah, casting is not an exact science, yeah. and I always think that there's a god of casting. Yeah. I don't know what his name would be, but, uh, or she, but, you know, it's a very painstaking process. Actors come in, they read, and I mean, the good thing again about equity waivers, you know that nobody's doing it for a job. They do it because they really like the material and they want to do theater. But you hear it and you listen and you look and you have the experience sometimes that somebody will walk in and two sentences into their reading, you know it. That's the right person. You can't explain it. It's a chemical reaction. And vice versa. There are people who have terrific acting credits, look great, walk in, and three seconds later, you know they're wrong for it. And yeah, for that specific It's not an exact art. science. I don't know how it's explained. Terry, in order for me to truly judge your ability as a director, I'm going to have to see you do a tragedy sometime uh, where the people don't move. Uh -huh, that's true. Because <laughs> based have... upon these, uh -huh. these two plays, La Ronda de Lunch and this, uh, the action is, moves a lot, and you always seem to have a misanthropic waiter. <laughs> I guess I do, but those also because those two, too. yeah, yeah. Well, we'll talk about collected stories, which is not a comedy. Oh right, actually, I'm I am now I've been hired to direct another play, uh, Collected Stories by Donald Margulies. Uh, it's a wonderful piece, and um, two really really nice actresses, really good actresses, Natalie Sutherland and um, April Lang, and coincidentally, uh, it's going to be at another theater here in the this complex, the Odyssey complex. I so, should explain that the yeah. Odyssey Theater is a three theater complex and it has probably one quarter of the work is done by the artistic director Ron Saucy and the other three play the other three theaters are filled with wonderful productions that come as visiting and I guess you would be considered a visiting production right we're guests 
your guess here. Terry has gone from usually a show of destruction almost immediately into rehearsals for a new play. Yeah. And that's it's exhausting because it's hard to let go of a play, more so for a director than a playwright. The first, I think, week or so afterwards, she goes to performances, she gives notes. It's like your children are finally in school. You have to walk away and, you know, it's very hard to do. So she's sort of still finishing up with Mutually Assured Destruction while she's in full-scale rehearsal for um, collected stories and very different types of plays. You're doing very well. The house was packed last night. I yeah. almost didn't get in. Well, it's a high-class problem. We are selling <laughs> out the show. Uh, at the moment, we, are, we have two more weekends, uh, the weekend of uh, August 17th, 18th and 19th, and the weekend of the 24th, 25th, 26th. So beside tonight, which is sold out on Sunday, is sold out, we have six more performances. Uh, we will make a decision this week whether we can extend or push into Thursday night. Because you're playing Fridays and Saturdays at 8. Mm -hmm. right. uh, are you doing a Sunday match? Sunday, Sunday at 3. Yeah. Sunday at 3. Right. So we're doing three performances a weekend, and, uh, which is pretty standard for equity waiver. And we're delighted, uh, you know, to, to have had this type of, uh, we must be getting some word of mouth. Uh, because we were surprised we can't even get in to see our own play. <laughs> But you're not working, thir uh, usually they, they do extend back to Thursday. Night. We might do that. We might do that. So we're just, yeah, we'll make that decision this week. We'll talk to the producer, Raquel Lerman, and so that is yet to be determined. Do you have another comedy collaboration you guys are working on? Well, I'm in the middle of writing uh, a comedy about the assassination of Leon Trotsky. <laughs> Which is really oh. funny. Isn't that? The, the, no. <laughs> It's a play I started a couple of years ago. I wanted to write a left-wing bedroom farce. And I, I read a little bit about Trotsky's exile in Mexico. He spent... Is uh, Frida Kahlo in it? Yes. yes. He spent his first couple of months, he and his wife, Natalia, lived with Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. And I said to myself, boy, there is a foursome. Leon Trotsky, <laughs> Nat Natalia Sadova, uh, Diego Rivera, and Frida Kahlo. So I decided to sit down and see where that took me. And often, as a writer, things go in funny directions. So uh, Terry hasn't seen this yet. It's not done yet. But we've talked about it a little bit. And it may be our next thing, maybe next winter, uh, when our life is getting too peaceful. And uh, we might put this up. Um, it's a little bit hard to keep the comedy going when the hatchet arrives, though. Well, you'd be surprised. Ah, but that's the <laughs> challenge. That's uh, the challenge, yeah. You know, it's an ice pick, by the way. It's actually. Oh. Wait, like ice point. picks are funny. Hatchets aren't funny, but an ice pick is funny. <laughs> and so we may be doing this, but you know, life is an adventure. We also have a film that we are hoping to get distribution for, and we are at the film festival. It's called Sweet Talk. And again, I should point out that Terry read a, a play of mine, Sweet Talk, which you may not or may not have seen. It's my second play, which was done in uh, at Actors Alley in 1992. And it was done in New York at the Manhattan Class Theater in 1996. And it's been done a couple of times. And she said, I think this can be a movie. And I said, no. And she turned out to be right. So we filmed it. You uh, heard it right here. 18 I was days right. last August with a wonderful cast, Natalie Z, and John, Jeffrey Vincent Parisi, and John Glover, and Karen Austin. And we are now uh, hopefully going to do the film circuit, uh, festival circuit, and be in theaters maybe next summer. There's one aspect of this this play. I'm going to bring it sure, back sure. to mutually assured destruction. You write buddies really well. Yeah, I mean, they were very believable. The her Arnie relationship. Yeah. Well, male bonding is a very strange activity. You know, men don't know how to talk to one another. So what they do, what we do, is we invent some sort of activity. Like let's go to a ball game together. Or, let's play poker. Or, let's play golf. Yeah. And so they go there, and in the play, of course, they have a lot of issues between the two of them. And in the middle of talking about sports and business, this stuff comes out. And uh, at one point, actually, one of the, the Carol says, if men could only talk t to one another, the world wouldn't be such a mess, which I happen to believe. And every time she says that line, the women kind of cheer in the audience. But I think male relationships are interesting and troublesome. And, you know, and you'll see also the women who talk to each other, they immediately just get right down to the, the nitty gritty. How's your marriage? How's your life? You know, how's your menstrual cycles? All the things that women talk about. You know? And men would never talk. We could be half dead and we wouldn't tell our friends. You but know. one of the big uh, tensions for the audience is, gosh, I hope nothing happens to break up these friendships because mm -hmm. they're pretty neat. Right. 
Well, the, one of the guys happens to know something about the other guy's wife, yeah. and he's got to pretend he doesn't know anything about yeah. it. And when the guy confides in him and he thinks his wife is, might be having an affair, he's, uh, he deflects it. You know, he keeps trying to keep this thing at a distance because he knows that if it gets back to him, he's going to have to explain to his wife that he drove 20 miles to get a cheap oil for And that's the whole thing. Gets, the lie becomes more and more complicated. At the beginning, if he just said, OK, I wanted to save $20, I went to uh, Canoga Park to get the oil check. But then there's a whole bunch of other things. He's supposed to be at the periodontist one afternoon. And he goes to have lunch with her, with Eve, because she's blackmailing him. Now he can't tell his wife he's been to the periodontist <laughs> and she brings, uh, no, he has to, anyway, it's a whole bunch of things. Terry, how well does he write for women? Oh, beautifully. I mean, actually, before I, I knew Peter, he uh, worked, did a lot of TV, and he worked on Cagney and Lacey right. and won an Emmy for that. And so I had nothing to do with his work on that show. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that he, happened. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, now he works and he writes beautifully. Yeah. Okay. He's. No arguments Good. among the actors that uh, she wouldn't say that? No, it's not arguments, actually. It's more kind of, and we have very um, intelligent actors, and so they're always questioning their characters. And so would she, would I, would this? And it, it's all in a, from a very helpful place that if something makes more sense, then, you know, Peter listens to that. Um, he has, of course, the last word. Um, but, yeah, there's always that questioning. Always that, but two of the actors, Bryn Thayer and, and Gina Hecht, were in La Ronde de Lunch. Right. And when we spoke to both of them about this, I mean, I mean, I know that you know Gina changed plans uh, in order to be in a in, in this production because of the writing. And Gina's one of my oldest friends. Oh, really? I, well, I then met you her know. the week she got hired for Mork and Mindy. Wow. Uh, and uh, which is many years ago. Yeah. And then I've seen her through all these different plays yeah. over, over the years. She's fantastic. She's a joy to watch on stage. Joy to watch, joy to work with, so smart, you know. So when you have that kind of person, when they ask you a question, you know, that's, it's important to listen to and, yeah. If a playwright doesn't yeah. listen to his or her actors, then I think he's doing so at the peril. Nine times out of ten, if an actor's having problems with a scene or a speech, it's badly written. Not always. But most, in most cases, a good actor will try to do it your way, the way it's written. And if they, they, you, can, you can see it actually during the auditions. One of the things right. about auditions that are very useful, you hear the scenes read. And when the scenes aren't working, you know there's a problem. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you, you guys for taking your time. Oh, Lovely. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Harry, Thank pleasure. You Peter. Thank you so much. You've been watching Theater Spotlight with Julio Martinez coming to you over LAArtStream.com. We celebrate the best in live theater and cabaret in the greater Los Angeles area. Los Angeles, which produces about 28 plays a week, professional theater. This is more than Boston, New York, London, West End combined. Thank you for joining us. We will be back with another edition of Theater Spotlight with Julio Martinez over LAArtStream.com. Thank you for joining.